Steve, what's up, man? How are you? My man, how are we doing today? I'm doing well, man. I don't even know. I don't even remember how uh, we originally got connected. I don't know if we started talking on Instagram first or, or what it was. I don't remember. Do you remember? You know, I don't even, I vaguely remember you had like a, you did have a post, like an inspirational post, like okay. one of your quotes. I know I shared it on my story. Okay. And, uh, cause I don't know, a lot of things that you say, it's just, they always hit home for me. I think I shared oh, it and you started following me or I started following you and that was it. Something in the virtual world, right? Yes. That's how it's it works. It's good and bad, the virtual world, right? Like, like it, it's going to create a relationship for us and a friendship, which, which is great. But as, sometimes at the same time, it, it's so terrible for some people, especially like young people, like it can be so bad for them because they're looking at like, you know, like you or me, for example, and they think that we've got it all figured out. And man, I don't have shit figured out. <laughs> no, nope, running on the fly every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I get these messages sometimes like, man, you're crushing it on this stuff and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, if you only fucking knew, Absolutely. if you only knew, I'm, uh, <laughs> Explain that for you. I mean, explain for how that is for you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, my day is my days are always crazy. Like I don't follow a playbook. You know, my 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 life went backwards. I did the whole. I worked on Wall Street. I had the corporate job. I did what you were supposed to do. I went to college. Mm -hmm. I got my MBA. I hated it. I hated the corporate world, and I left it all to follow my passion. And dude, like you know, I mean, MMA it, it got my soul. I started wrestling mm -hmm. at a very early age. And uh, I started rolling like jujitsu um, when I was mm -hmm. in college. And I was like, man, like I love that more than going to work. And that just kind of got me into the whole world of MMA. And I ended up leaving the industry and moving in California. Let's talk about the, the beginning. Like what made you go do the corporate thing? Like you grew up in Rhode Island, you said, right? Yep. Um, so what was the original appeal to the corporate? I think that, you know, the problem with being young is you don't really know what you want to do. Who knows what they want to do as a teenager? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's a very small subset of people. Usually it's because you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, but for the most of us, we don't really know. And for me, my senior year in high school, we played something called the stock market game in my American experience class. And I just felt I had a knack for it. I loved it. And I say, you know something, I'm going to go to the school that's closest to Wall Street, which was Pace University in New York City. And uh, I majored in finance and marketing and uh, worked on Wall Street for two years and up in Connecticut. And man, like working for a paycheck is great for a short period of time. Like anybody can do anything and be happy for a few months or maybe a year. But after a while, you know, that that allure always wears off. And for me, I'm a passion driven person, probably like yourself. And I just can't go to work for a paycheck. I got to enjoy what I do, like genuinely enjoy it. I can't fake it. So I just grew out of it. How long did you do it? What's that? Uh, the Wall Street gig. Oh, well, Wall Street was two years and then I moved to Connecticut and I was there for four. So six okay. years. And then what was the transition like? Because I'm assuming you were making decent money because most people on Wall Street make decent money, right? And this is something that we do, right? We go, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this because I can make a lot. Yep. Because that, that's the definition of being successful in America, right? Make as much money as you can. And when you're young, I mean, how many people, listen, when I was in college, I graduated in 2005. So back then, being an entrepreneur wasn't cool. It's not like how it is now where everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Back then it was, I remember my senior year, everyone coming into class when they got their jobs. Like, oh my God, I got, a, I got a job with Goldman Sachs. Oh my God, I got a job with this person. That was the highlight of everybody. Whereas now it's not really like that. Now it's about being an entrepreneur and trying to figure it out yourself. I still don't think most people want to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, you know? it, it, it like, seems so cool. What I, yeah, it seems cool. What I think of when I think entrepreneur like, so even for like me, I have three businesses, but they're all kind of in the same area. Yeah. So I don't even know if that's on really true entrepreneurial for like an entrepreneur is somebody who's just like over here, like they can see like, okay, I have a car wash. I have a jujitsu school. I have a dry clean, you know, or, or I have an online business. Like that's that real entrepreneurial for me. Like I love what I do. And yep. for that, that's it. So like, uh, you know, I, I figured out different <laughs> businesses in what I love to do. 
true entrepreneurs are like over here and over there. But, you know, I think that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. I can agree with that. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's easier to have one your staple business and start to veer off a little mm-hmm. bit, little tentacles, like I guess right. subsidiaries, I guess you could call them. Right. So I'm kind of entrepreneurial in my, in, in my, in my <laughs> work in how I would see it. I'm not, I'm not full entrepreneur, so, but, but yeah, that, that was how it was for us. You, uh, I can remember I went to school, man. I was a math major. It was like, I was going to be a fucking actuary. Oh shit. I, <laughs> I, 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 I could not imagine sitting behind a desk all day, like figuring out uh, probabilities. That would, that sounds very terrible to me. No, absolutely not. I couldn't do that either. So what made you, was it a slow process, this, okay, I'm going to make a change? Or was it like, uh, like inception almost, like one day you woke up and boom, change? No, it was, I woke up and it was boom. I knew it. Okay. I'm a, I'm a very passion-driven person. So when you once, say that, once, there's a lot of, go ahead. Yes, yeah, you know, I'm saying first, once I'm turned off, I'm turned off. And that's it. It's a wrap. And I right. kind of can't, I can't get it back. Me too. I'm the same with like food as well. Like once I don't like it anymore, I'm over you. But until that point, I'll eat it every day. Sorry, I no, you're good. So <laughs> when, when that morning came, yes. what was it? What did you do? Like, did you go into work and quit that day or what happened? No, it was, it was, it was like a slow process. I, I should backtrack. It was a slow process mm-hmm. of, just, you know, you start hating your life and you start, you know, you hate what you do and every day becomes more miserable, more miserable. And you kind of just slowly just fade out. And I, and, yeah. I, and I just knew it was over. I just knew, you know, making appointments, making phone calls, seeing people and then getting that check, just, it just didn't fulfill me. Even though, but, but other things about it did, and I'm, I'm just pushing back here. So for, for the listeners, right? Like other things did, I'm sure you're going to nice dinners. I'm sure you had a nice house. I'm sure you drove a fat fucking car. Right. Like uh, people knew who you were. Right. Because, Absolutely. you know, Steve's walking in, he's got a bunch of money and he's going to spend a bunch of money with us and yada, yada. So uh, and, and that does definitely touch the ego in a way. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. But again, you know, I try to tell people money shouldn't be your driver. Like, I don't know. Again, some people are driven by money and some people are just driven by, I don't say purpose, like purpose in their in their uh in their success, I guess you could say, you know, for right. example, I, I go back into wall street right now and be in finance and make a couple hundred grand a year. No problem. But I know I'd be miserable. I'd rather <laughs> find my way up to the top and doing something that I love. I, I, I don't even, yeah, I agree with you. And even if I don't meet the top of like this business, you know, like maybe, maybe you don't become Tony Robbins and, and yeah. all right, you know, but the chase is really cool. The, ch- oh, the chase man. for me is amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, as a, you know, when you say the chase, it's like, you know, when you're a fighter, you have to also love fight camp. If you want to be a fighter, it can't just be getting in the cage. I'm going to fight one day. You got to love the process leading up to it. Otherwise, you're going to hate your life as a fighter, too. Yes, you have to love to train. Like, if, yeah. if you don't love to train, then you're fucked. <laughs> yep. Right. Because you exactly. have to train all the time. It's not oh. just fighting. If all you do is fight, you suck. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, you suck. And, and then that's not fun either. You know, that's not fun either. My friend used to say, uh, when I first started fighting, he's like, Elliot, you're not a real fighter, right? You're not a real fighter until you lose a fight and then choose to fight again. Truth. Because that's, that's when you see, right? That's when you really see like, oh man, that sucked. You know, yeah, that sucked. Do I really want to do this? Because that was terrible. And that- so. And that's the beauty of wrestling. I always tell people, man, like every boy and girl should start wrestling at an early age because you're never going to win all the time. It's impossible. And you're going to lose. You're going to get embarrassed sometimes. You got to come back the next day and get on the mat and still go just as hard and be just as strong. So it's, there's, that's why I love that sport. There's something different to getting your ass kicked physically. Yeah. Right. Like I've lost at a lot of things, basketball, football, like you lose. And and like, I totally understand all of that, but there's something different about somebody being able to hold you down, beat your ass and you can't do anything about it. Like, it's not just, I lost. It's this like emotional experience of, 
oh my god yeah because you figure like whether it's wrestling or or mma or even jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. you are two people that have both given your soul for however many weeks preparing for battle and then when another human beats you it it, it hurts it hurts emotionally for a minute i mean you got to get mm -hmm. over it and bounce back but you, you feel that differently than anything else what was your transition like into this new world of yours when you stopped the old job and became the new job and, and became this new Steve? I, I, I was me. I was me. Yeah. Even, even before working, the only time I ever felt truly free was on a wrestling mat. And okay. obviously, you know, when I got back onto the mat to, for, uh, for jujitsu, I just fell in love. It was like, I couldn't wait to get out of work to be on the mat again to go grapple you know and mm -hmm. i also had that first like that drink the kool-aid of jujitsu you know mm -hmm. where the first time i did it i was like oh shit because i remember the first time so i got invited down to come train one day um because i was a wrestler and i'm talking to this dude who was a black belt said, yeah you should come down and, and try it you know because back then what year is this this is 2004 okay early you no know? pretty early yeah, so back then, you know, wrestlers were just starting to get into jiu-jitsu more and more. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he was, you know, come down, come down. So I went down, and I had rolled for the first time. And it was his brother, uh, Joe Abate, who at the time was a purple belt. And, dude, he tapped me out probably 10 times in three minutes. It was probably the most humbling experience ever. <laughs> I was like, oh, my you're God. Because you're <laughs> tough. You're, yeah, tough. you're was, a tough dude. You can wrestle. You've been on the mat your whole life. And, like... You'd probably be okay with it if some badass black belt did it, but some like <laughs> purple belt, like, dude, your belt's purple. How'd you fuck me up like that? <laughs> Seriously, it was a crazy experience. And I, you know, I think some people would be discouraged after something like that, right? But then there's other people that it, it drives them and motivates them. It's like, oh, I don't want that to ever happen again. I have to learn this. Mm -hmm. And it was such a humbling experience that, man, I was addicted. I was doing gi every day, you know, the double class, no gi, gi, no gi, gi. And, I just, I just went balls out. I think it's so interesting, like what you just said right there. Um, and I think it ties to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump subjects a little bit, like this idea of, oh my God, like that just happened to me. I, I, and they run from it. Uh, I think like the police problem that we have, you know, I think it comes down to that. I think it comes down to like, how are you not running towards jujitsu? Like, yeah. how are you how, like, you know, like, cause to me, uh, and it's very interesting. I just talked to somebody who, you know, finished the academy and he's like, man, we practice pulling our guns out so much, like going from here, like they, they get so much practice of that through the academy and they get like four hours of hand to hand combat. And I'm like, dude, I, it should totally be the other way around. Agreed. Right? Like totally agree it should you. be all jujitsu. Like now, you know, like, like the race problem that with police, I think that ties into it later. But the first problem is that these motherfuckers don't know how to fight, right? Like, I, I agree. If you knew how to fight, you know, then when you saw another dude who, whatever, scares you for some reason, and that, that's where I think maybe the other problems come, you wouldn't care so much because you're like, I'm going to fuck that dude up. Yeah, you, know? you stay composed like, under pressure. Yeah. So I like how that isn't the, how it's like, oh my God, that just happened to me. I need to go learn that isn't the reaction for all cops. Like when they see some of these other videos, how they, how, how they think, Oh, I, I could handle that. That wouldn't happen to me is, is beyond me. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just like going, uh, a, uh, you know, most, most everyone thinks they can fight until they have to get into a fight. You know? <laughs> You're right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, you think you can fight? Let, let me just see you hit, see you punch some mitts for a second. And you're just like the craziest thing you've ever seen. You realize like people can't fight. For the right. most part, you really have to it's, learn. It's it's a skill. Right. And it's, so same thing, like when you talk about like pulling out guns as a police officer, how often does a police officer actually have to pull out his gun to, to not to shoot someone or to defend himself? It's a very, very rare occasion. So, right. that, so they don't need to do they don't need to do that as much as like you're saying. They really need to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then for me, the hand-to-hand -hand combat has made me speak better to people as well. Mm. because uh you know you're on the mat with somebody uh you know i'm on the mat with a purple belt who i'm way better than let's say just way better than and i slip up for a second and i make a mistake 
And that happens, right? Of course. That happens in live scenarios. And if you add uh, the other things that we take out of jujitsu uh, that aren't controlled, if you slip up, oh my God. So like, that makes me want to never fight, like never. So that I have to get really good with my words and yep. be like, all right, yeah, man, like, dude, homie, chill. Like, it's, it's, you know, like, and speak to people now in a more skillful way because I'm in this combat situation every single day. And I don't want to maybe have that be one of the times that I slip up. Absolutely true. Yeah. I don't, I don't think uh, mo- most people who know how to fight don't get to fight in the don't street. Fight. Sure. Yeah, so you last- only get fight when you're paid. When you're paid, yeah. <laughs> unless <laughs> you're Colby, unless you're Colby Covington and Masvidal. Masvidal's like, yeah. fuck that. You beat my ass. You beat my ass in when we got paid. I'm gonna get this back right now. Yeah, they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. So you you go through this transition. You start to like le- you leave your job. You're getting back on the mat. Uh, how do you start to make like uh, that's really cool, bro. That I mean, I I, I love that story. Uh, but how do you make a living? How, what do you start, what do you do? Like you, like at the end of the day, uh, you still got to put food on the table. You still got to, you know, have a house, a place to live. Uh, yeah. You don't want, it's not like you want to go from making really good money, you know, six figure job, probably to making 20 grand, like scraping yeah. by on things. So what do you do to make a living? Yeah. So when I, we end up packing up and moving to San Diego, uh, my best friend at the time, he was teaching boxing classes and kickboxing classes at a place called the Boxing Club in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Now, during the time while I was working, I would probably go out there once or twice a year just to train and have fun. And I was doing jiu-jitsu at the time. This was before he even started grappling. He's now a black belt. He's a monster. But I would go out there and I was always like, man, if I ever leave my job, I'm moving here and I'm going to come work at the boxing club. And I actually started working at the boxing club. So I was teaching the boxing classes. I was teaching the kickboxing classes and holding mitts and doing the no gi. And you like, I actually enjoyed that. I enjoyed making $50 an hour more than making, you know, money uh, in finance. So, so how did, so, and then so that, there, that's what, I mean, ultimately that's what paid the bills between that and my savings. And, uh, and I trained, I just trained. I was, I was, I was eight and slept in the gym, eat, sleep, gym, eat, sleep, gym. Yeah. <laughs> And when you say we, you were married at the time? Uh, I wasn't married, but I am now to who my okay. fiance was at the time. Yeah. Gotcha. Kids, no kids. Like, did you bring your whole family out or? Yeah. Well, I didn't have a kid yet. So I have my okay. eight-year-old son, Jax. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So you move out there. You're doing this. You're doing this eat, sleep, train thing. And yeah. then what comes next? Um, I had an amateur fight. Someone last minute said, Hey, Steve, would you do this amateur fight? And I was like, never really thought about it, but I said, yeah, sure. Why not? And I did it. And let me tell you something, the most terrifying experience of my life, terrifying and the most, um, exhilarating experience of my life at the same time. Like after that one fight, I was literally addicted after I left that mat or it was a ring. It was an amateur fight. It was in a ring. I was like, I got to do this again. I got to do this again. And I just kept on going at it. And I kind of, I did the, the backwards approach, I should say, when it comes to MMA. One thing I don't like about the sport is I feel like guys feel like they have to fight whoever the toughest guy is all the time. Whereas boxing, they build their records to get that composure, get that experience, you know? So my first eight fights were bums. I won eight, you know, quick. I fought like every other month. And I got the experience. I was still scared every single time, even against a guy who was like 0 and 5, you know? And I just built that and, and I really enjoyed it. But I did beat up my body just nonstop fight camps for like two, three years. I didn't stop. Right. Yeah. MMA and boxing are way different in that, in that aspect, right? Like, and I think MMA does it unskillfully in the sense of look, I had five fights, maybe six. Yeah, six fights. <laughs> and then I was in the UFC. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, I'm terrible at fighting. My, my fight skills are good, right? Like all of the skills that Elliot has. Okay. But I'm terrible at fighting. Could you imagine playing six football games and then being in the, in the NFL? You've played six fucking games. Truth. Right? Absolutely true. Yeah. Six. You play six football games in a season as <laughs> yeah. a peewee football player. 
so true. <laughs> right, you know? So like showing up and going to a football game, the feelings of that are, are very normal. You know, you get used to that. You get used to the pressure and how it feels to walk out. Dude, I walked out six times. And then the next thing I know, I'm in this massive arena with thousands of people in it and millions of people watching. And you're like, oh my God. Yep. There's no practice at fighting. Exactly, dude. You can spar as much as you want. It doesn't truly prepare you for getting the cage live under pressure. Your reflexes are different. Your timing's a little different. Um, it's, it's just a much different ball game for yeah. sure. It, it, yeah, it's, it's live go. Like you've, you've, it's the only time that somebody's really trying to knock you out. Like exactly. knockouts happen in the gym, right? Like, yep. and those things happen, but no one is trying to, right? Exactly. You know? So there's just a different intensity to that. Like, you're not like, when I go to spar, I'm not like, you know what? I think I might die from getting head kicked and then pounded out. Like that, that never went through my head. No. You know, but it does go through your head on fight day. Oh, yes, it does. And adrenaline too, right? It's, it's yeah. not easy to control adrenaline. You know, when you go in sparring and you're going against other monsters, like I was sparring with Kelvin Gastelum and Michael Chandler. I was at Alliance in San Diego. Right. And dude, we punched the shit out of each other, but it's different. It's not like going into a cage and fighting another human and you have bad intentions mm -hmm. and there's a lot of on, you have adrenaline and that adrenaline dump you cannot replicate that in a gym you can't so uh you're not a ufc fighter you know uh and uh i don't i, I don't know what your record is i i didn't look yeah. you know that is not uh that is not what you do you do this smash global thing how did you transition into that yeah so my last so i won eight and oh right and then I had the opportunity to go to Melbourne, Australia to fight their number one kid. His name was Nick Patterson. I think he was 16 and four at the time. And uh, so I went to Melbourne. I felt great. I had to lose 20 pounds on fight week, unfortunately. It's like oh, I gained funny. weight on the plane. It was crazy. And uh, no excuse, no excuse. Right. Um, but that night, man, I just, you know, fighting at I don't know, three o'clock in the morning. I, I didn't train for that. And I should have. I regret that. But do that first round, that first exchange, and I was pitter pattering. I threw a left hand, he threw a right, and he caught me. It was like split time. I have this picture, it like shows me slightly missing and catching me. I dropped. Um, I remember being on all fours, pouring. First time I've ever, I dropped like that. And I'm right. and I can't train for this. So I'm on the ground. I'm on all fours. My nose is pouring blood. He's behind me throwing punches. It sounds like gunshots going off in the back of my head. But obviously, you don't really feel it. Adrenaline. The ref saying improve your position. I'm next to my corner. He's yelling at me. We're the main event. The crowd is so loud. I can't even hear myself think. I've never been in that situation. All I had to do was turn over, pull guard, get my composure back. I mean, it's common sense. But before I could even happen, even thought about it, the ref you know, ended the fight. The fight was over. Back to my hotel room. Literally, what I was like, I remember the movie Friday. Mm -hmm. I remember I was in my hotel room. I had anxiety like I never had in my life. I never felt that loss. You know, I gave everything for that fight. I was in my hotel room. I'm like Chris Tucker in the pigeon coop. Remember when he like smoked angel dust? I'm, I'm really <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not how I feel. I was like an outer body experience. <sighs> you know, I'm by myself. My other teammates, my coach, they went out and partied. I'm not that guy. I'm like more of a reflection kind of person. I stayed mm -hmm. back and I just kind of knew it was over. I think I was 33 or 34 at the time. I had knee surgery prior. I had a pinch nerve on my neck from fight camp. And I was like, man, I don't think I have it in me to go through, you know, three, four more fight camps. I just wanted to make one run to get to the UFC. You know, and I was like, man, at 34, I don't think I can bounce back and do this all over again. So I said to myself, what can I do to stay in my sport that I genuinely love so much? And it was either open up my own gym, which at the time I didn't want to do because I was like, yeah, I got to fucking be up at four o'clock in the morning, train people at six. And I got to clean mass at 10 p.m. I'm not doing it. So I said, what can I do to make it better? And at the time, and I always had I me mean, no disrespect to the fans of MMA. I just felt like MMA was very NASCAR crowd. 
it just grew so fast in such a short period of time. It was very tap out t-shirts, bud lights, everyone bleed, 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 you know? Whereas boxing has centuries of histories and buildup and you have, you know, seven year old couple going and sitting in the first row with a fur coat and a suit. I was like, I want that Why crowd. Why does nobody boo at a boxing fight? It never happens. Yeah, you're actually right. Yeah. No matter who, no matter the, the, the style of the fight or anything, I just thought of it as you said that. Nobody ever boos. Nope. Nope. Yeah, it's a... It's, uh, huh. Yeah, and it's funny. So I don't want to fast forward too much, but when I had yeah. my first show, when I had my first show, one thing that was so amazing was these people had never been to a live event in the first place. So it was a different crowd. So you went into promoting, you went on to putting on shows. That's what's, yeah. Yep, yeah. Go so I, I got my, I got my license with the California State Athletic Commission. Um, I had two shows in San Diego and then I had, hold on one second. Yep. My wife is interrupting me. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. You're good. Um, so where was I at? You have two shows in San Diego. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I had two shows in San Diego. Now, the first show that I had was at the Hard Rock Casino, Hard Rock Hotel, downtown San Diego. And when I mm -hmm. picked them on the idea, they're like, oh, you know, it's kind of confirmed what I was doing. They said, you know, we don't want we don't want MMA fights in our hotel because it doesn't add any value. We got to we have to add security. We got to do this. We got to do that. And I was like, well, this is this is literally uh putting credibility and why I need to change the sport and add value to it. Um, so at my first show there, I just changed the way it was done. Instead of having your, you know, your open format, it was black tying gown. It was seated dinner. It was open bar. It was red carpet. It was a ticket price point that kind of phased out the MMA community. You know, as you know, with the local MMA show, how they sell tickets, the fighters sell it for them. I, just, I hate it. I know it, that was the worst it. part of the local show, right? It's not no. my job. Like I always felt like as a fighter, it's not my job to promote. Yeah, like my job is to show up and fight. Like you should want like, and even the UFC doesn't do this, right? Like the UFC nope. goes, okay, that guy's going to sell tickets for people to come, but he's yeah. not going to actually physically go sell tickets, which yeah. is insane to me. It's, it's the lazy man fighter. Yep, exactly. So, you know, it's, Hey, well, they're going to pay you at like $500 to fight, but guess what? You also have to sell a 20 ticket. So you're basically paying yourself through your ticket sales. And that sucks for a fighter. Um, so that's what happened. And they so, get mad at you. They get mad at you if you don't sell tickets and you're like, yo, dude, dude. I was training. <laughs> Fuck off. Seriously. You know? So, and the biggest problem with, with that is what happens, you're selling $30 tickets or $20 tickets. What happens is you have a $20 crowd. Right. You know, most fighters don't have a, a higher net worth, net, a higher, aren't from a higher net worth demographic. Mm -hmm. They can sell, you know, for example, they'll, they'll offer, hey, we could sell $100 VIP tickets. How many fighters are selling those tickets? Not many. Mm -mm. You know, so I want to bring in that crowd that would pay $300, $500 for a ticket to go watch MMA like you would if you're going to sit in the front row of a, of a boxing venue. I and mean, those people are paying thousands of dollars. So I want to provide an experience for people to come and, and not feel like they're in this threatening atmosphere so they could network as well. So like I said, that's why I made a black tie and gown, um, the whole seated dinner, the, the open bar, a lot of celebrities come. I honor someone who's made a significant impact in the sport or in combat sports in general, because that kind of draws a lot of people and it's kind of a way to give back as well. So a dude who was a fighter, a dude who was a finance guy, who became a fighter, who quote unquote didn't make it. Yeah. And then does this fight thing a little different. You're not yeah. trying to, you're not competing at all with the other local shows. No, not at all. Nope. Other than maybe, you know, going after some of their fighters, but you know how it is with local shows, you're not putting anybody on a contract and fighters are right. stopping just to find fights on local shows in the first place. How do you pay the fighter? Like, you know, because it sounds like this, this, this way has some expense too, you know, some, a much higher expense than, uh, than, you know, all you do is show up and give them money or, or all you do is show up and 
you know, for $20 and then they go buy their beer and yada, yada. Yeah, absolutely. So, but I also have, you know, you go to a normal pro fight, a local show, there's about what, 15, sometimes 20 fights on a card, Mm -hmm. you know, crazy. I only do five fights because if you're going to an experience like this, generally after about four fights, people start losing interest. You've ate dinner, you're drinking. Now it's 11 o'clock. You're kind of, let's go on to the next thing. So I max out of five fights. I actually hope that one of them falls off. So I have four, okay. four perfect number, but I had a show where I had four fights and I, and two of them didn't make it. I only had two fights. So the so day then... of like calling salsa dancers to come in, <laughs> dance in the cage, <laughs> I, 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 did a, I did a female grappling, grappling uh, bout as well. Got it. So but yeah, so, these so people, you go for five, you hope one falls off. If it doesn't, it's no big deal. It's five. If one falls off, you still have four. Exactly. Yeah. And that's perfect. Yeah. Cool. Because then I can do like um, two fights, an honoring ceremony, two fights, or I'll do like three fights, honoring ceremony, main event, depending. Mm-hmm. Um, and you still train? Yes, I don't. Mm, I train very hard in a different way, like more strength conditioning. Okay. I, uh, I've had a lot of injuries in the last couple of years. I tore my ACL a year and a half ago. And then six oh, months God, after right in the middle of COVID, that sucks. Yeah. And then right after six months after my ACL surgery, the doctor cleared me to start training again. First day back. No, I'm sorry. A month into training, I tore my Achilles. Same leg? Other leg. <laughs> I wish it was the <laughs> same leg. <laughs> <laughs> so both of your legs are fucked rather than yeah, just one. So, so both my my ACL healed amazing. Like it, it's fine. My Achilles man is a, a nightmare. Yeah. July yeah. will be a year and it's probably 70% maybe. Yeah. Tough injury. Um what advice do you give to people who uh like, you know, they, they hear your story. Uh, Steve quit his job and yada, yada, and then moved on. But sometimes, look, uh, fear's a real thing. Absolutely. Right? Fear, fear's a real thing. And people get stuck. You get stuck because you're afraid. Yep. And you've been afraid, and I've been afraid, and we've all been afraid. But somehow we've been able to conquer that, right? Somehow we've been able to, to you know, what does Joe Rogan say? Quiet the inner bitch. Right? Yes. Absolutely. So, uh and I love that statement, but it's not so easy for everyone. And especially right now in the world, we're seeing a lot of people struggling, right? A lot of people are struggling. We're seeing a lot of things, right? Uh, you know, people are quitting their jobs and people are, you know, these mental health problems because of the pandemic. And I'm, and I'm not talking the legitimacy of the pandemic or whatever. It is a result of the pandemic. Uh, what do you say to these people that are really, really stuck? Man, you want you, something different. You have to take, you have to take a risk. You can't be scared of uncertainty. And that's a problem. You know, you just, I'm big on the whole hard roads become easy, easy roads become hard mindset. Okay. You know, so you start with the easy road, which is just, let's say, let's just do what's easy. Be in corporate America. Every single one of those people for the most part will complain over time. I feel like you really find people who are entrepreneurs that do their own thing, that complain about it, or they're unhappy. Yeah, it's a struggle, but usually they enjoy the struggle. I enjoy it. I enjoy the chaos. I enjoy the uncertainty. I have times where I doubt myself, which is probably every other day. But what does that feel like? What does that doubt sound like? You know, I think it's, it's just a friendly reminder. Like, I'm, I'm human. Like you're supposed to doubt yourself. Like you said, like, when, when you fight and you're scared, like, Every time you're walking into the cage, like, oh my God, why am I doing this? You're in the back room. You're like, I could be at home eating pizza. I could be in the stands right now drinking a beer, just chilling. But instead, I fucking just shit for the 10th time <laughs> in the back. <laughs> I'm so nervous. You know, but Dude, I used to hate to fight in Vegas because, like, <laughs> you look out your hotel room window and there's all these fine ass chicks partying <laughs> and you're like i'm up here scared shitless in a fucking locked in a hotel room not eating you know like oh my god like what am i doing like what am i doing yeah you know at I least would always, like when you're fighting like lincoln nebraska you don't see anybody having fun <laughs> no absolutely not we're at one of the places i used to fight 
it was way up in the mountains in a place called pa uh, Pala, California, down in San Diego. Okay. And uh, every time we get off the highway, you start to go up this mountain. It's probably about six miles of like turns. Yeah. Like, my heart would be coming out of my chest. I just would turn silent, so nervous. I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You know, and every, no one else really knows that you're going through those emotions because you're also, trying, yeah, because you're trying yeah. to hide, trying to go, oh, I'm calm. It's no big deal. I'm fighting. I'm a tough guy. When in actuality, you're like, dude, why am I doing this again? <laughs> right. And this teaches us how to overcome fear. You know, Agreed. everyone doesn't have this lesson of fighting. You know, I wish everyone did. I wish everyone had to go do one, like, you know, three fights because one fight's easy. Just walk in the cage. Okay. You don't know what to expect from me. My second yeah. fight was the worst, but I was like, oh my God, I've never been scared like that before in my life. And now <laughs> I'm going to do it again. You know, yeah, so exactly. we've had these lessons. What are some steps that you take in your daily life now that you, that, that, uh, help you overcome these fears and these doubts? I mean, honestly, I think that I've, I don't know if this really helps a lot of people me saying this, but I feel like I've failed so many times that failure doesn't scare me anymore. It's just part of life. And that's the biggest problem with people. People are so scared to fail, whether it's whether they're scared or they care what other people think about them failing. And that's another problem with society now. I don't care. Yes, I shouldn't say that. I do care what people think. Everybody cares, but you have to just overcome that, that, we all have struggles. We all have problems. I just talked about this last night in my class because uh, I cooked the pastrami over the weekend for the first time, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. From start to finish, from like I cured the corned beef, everything. It's a five-day process, right? This whole cooking of a pastrami. And I got done and it wasn't that good. It was okay. Like I cook well and it was just okay. Uh, and I was like, man, I don't think I want to go through this whole five days again to learn because like, like, you know, learning how to cook well or something like that. Well, takes practice just like everything else. But yeah. five, every, each time's fucking five days. Fuck my life. Uh, so I was like telling everybody about this in the beginning, like joking around. And then I used it as the speech. I was like, look, I have no problem telling you that I failed at cooking up a or yeah. that I failed at anything. And I, I literally I said those words. I don't care what you think about me. Like I care. Like. Like I care. It's, it's a really weird thing, right? Like yeah. I can't, I don't want to be an asshole, but if you think I'm an asshole and I'm not doing asshole shit, what can I do? You know, what can I do? It's absolutely true. I saw a good thing, you know, about, uh, offending people, right? It's impossible not to offend people. You know, if I'm talking to just you, can I offend you? Yes. Now I'll say, I say the same thing to 10 people. 100 people, 1,000 people, you're always going to offend somebody at some point, no matter what. And you can't get past that. And people have to get over it. You just have to be yourself. Uh, look, it, it's what your shirt says. Hate, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I might yeah. offend you. But the question, because it, it, is it coming from like a hateful way, right? Am yeah. I saying all black people are bad? Well, now look, I'm offending a lot of people. And uh, that's hate right? Yeah. There, there, there's this difference, you know, and I, and I like with the whole free speech thing that we're talking about so much now in, in the world, right? Like, man, if it's not hate speech, and I, and I agree that we shouldn't allow hate speech, right? Like, you know, but uh, if it just makes you sad, go, go, like, look, that's on you not to be sad. Homie. And then I can try my best to not agree. make as many people sad, but like, nobody can offend me. It's my choice whether or not I'm going to be offended. I agree with you. It's a fact. So speaking of that, I'm also, uh, I'm running for Senate here in Connecticut, you okay. know, and where I am. So I'm already past the primary. I'm going up against a guy named Martin Looney. He was going into his 16th term in office, which is already a problem. Already a problem. Already a problem. Now me as a minority, I'm half black, half white. I'm also Republican now was, was a lifelong Democrat. I just become more conservative with age. I actually hate the two-party system. It's more like liberal and conservative. You kind of bounce through. Like, dude, I'm liberal on some things. I'm conservative on others. I just, my, just, my values just align a little bit more with conservative side. Having a family, owning a business, just normal stuff. But this like party affiliation is literally what's dividing. Terrible. It's terrible. 
terrible. It's so terrible. I, 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 can't, I can't grasp it. Like, <laughs> I, I look, I'll say I lean, I'm half black too. I'm half black and, you know, my dad's black, my mom's white. And maybe let's say I lean a little more the other way because of like some social issues. But yeah, like where, where like, where, okay, quote unquote, my party is now go fuck yourself and i'm sure you feel very similar with the republican party but like where like go no fucking way you know so like i don't and i think most people are here and then somehow we go boop and then we hate each other yeah well we're also letting like the far left we're letting like the far left and the far right who bark the loudest dictate the future of our country and our politicians are also catering to the catering to them yeah because they're so loud yeah, they're, they're the catering platform. to them. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're catering to them on both sides, and I'm both like, sides. dude, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? No, you know, no, go fuck yourself. But I think what this comes down to is, from my perspective, uh, this whole barking thing is it's too much. Like, if you have to bark, really, like, uh, walk soft but carry a big stick my friend likes to say oh i like that you know you know you walk soft you walk soft uh you don't have to tell everyone how badass you are no absolutely i you know you you don't have to do that like tom brady yes like you know everyone gets a super bowl shirt like super bowl champion when they win them and he's got seven of them or he had seven of them i they're either in storage or thrown away he never wears them in public nope because why everyone knows who he is truth that's the best quarterback in history so walking around be like i'm a lion bro i'm a fucking man like (laughs) you know it it drives me insane it drives me insane yeah when you say that so my favorite humans on the planet my favorite personality are the humble savages Mm -hmm. that walk around they're very humble but as soon as they have to go that savage turns on like how many fighters do you know i can tell like yourself you're calm, you're cool, collected, always nice. But as soon as that cage door closes, you got to turn on that alter ego and go. And the and cage door that- doesn't close for me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> right? It doesn't close for me. So that dude rarely has to show up. Truth. You know, he has to show up in other ways. Father, husband, uh, leader of a school, you know, as it does for you. Father, husband, leader of your business. You know, you have to show up str- with strength and positivity. You know, and you have to hold a line, but this, this fighter, Elliot almost never has to show up in the world. Yeah. Agreed with you. Agreed. The only time, like I can only remember one time that I really wanted to fuck somebody up, bro. In in recent history. And and I talk about it all the time. I show up at my, my son's lacrosse game and there's this dude with a shirt on and it says lions, not sheep. And he's got on his pant lions, not sheep. And he's got a hat on his head, lion, not sheep. And I wanted to walk up to him and be like, yo, bro, I'm going to fuck you up and I'm going to show you that you're not a lion. Okay. I'm yeah. not saying I'm, I'm not saying I'm a lion. I'm not going to say that, but what I'm saying is you're not. And the reason I know you're not is because you're screaming that you are, you know, you're screaming that you are. So let's, let's just take that shirt off. Like just wear one piece of paraphernalia. Don't have all of it. Like I'm you're trying you. to, you know, I, I can't stand it. And well, then that was again like, on the, go ahead. Yeah, that was like the the, the tap out phase, tap right. out hat, tap out t shirt. Half these guys never even trained in the first place. Like, why are you right. wearing that stuff? You don't like. I never even wore a tap out piece of, of clothing ever. I did because you know? they get. I was friends with those guys because it was like yeah. we were OGs no, back in the beginning. So that's yeah, you know, no, but so that's support, different. Yeah, support yes. the brand. They're a very very integral part of the growth of MMA. But mm-hmm. a lot of guys like the lines. Uh, not sheep that same mentality mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then on the other side we're ha- like like uh like it's okay to be weak no it is not no it is <laughs> you not. no no it is not it is not okay to be weak you know it like uh we believe i'm sure i feel you're probably the same yes it is my job to bring everybody up in the world i would love to be able to do that yeah but i also see it as my job to bring my fucking self up Absolutely. You know, you know, I have to bring myself up. I'm, I'm not here to be protected. I, I will protect myself. You have to. 
it just, I can't like, so you have this one side screaming one way, right. And then yep. especially with men, you know, and, and that's, it kills me with men one side screaming one way. And then you have this other side, like it's okay to be weak. And I'm just like, God damn it. What, how do we get here? Yeah. Well, you know what it is? It's, it's the, it's the all. So right now there's this all or nothing movement, right? So it's mm -hmm. these, these men who think they're so tough and that's toxic, right? The lions and sheep. Yeah. So then the far left pushes back with, no, you don't have to be tough and you can be weak and a man can be defined as this and that. It's no different. I don't want to go off topic. I'm only saying it because it's like we, like uh -huh. yesterday, the abortion topic, right? You have you have one side, which is the right. They're saying they're they're pushing back on the abortion narrative because the left is saying it's okay to have an abortion nine months. Now listen, that's murder. That should not be allowed. But then okay. you have the people yeah. on the right, on the other side, that are saying, no, 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 you know. The, the complete opposite. So we need to have abortion. It's so they push back on each other so hard. Like, why can't there be a compromise? Why can't there be like, hey, listen, you know, I, we should be able to have it up until twelve weeks. That's a compromise. The the, the left gets a little bit. You might be a right. hardcore Christian and be against it, but at least you're appeasing to the masses in some capacity. Look for for the world. I'm pro-choice, right? Yeah, for, for like how I see it. I'm pro-choice. I do not think that you should be doing that past a certain amount of time. Like we should have had that decision made. Now, look, if the health and the risk of the mother and the baby come into play, yep. we, we have some circumstances that we're going to have to deal with. Agreed. Right. Like, uh, and then on the right, like, but it should be like, there are some hard statistics around abortion and what happens when we make it fully illegal. Crime is going to go up. Right. Because yeah. you're going to have people having babies that don't want babies and that we don't want to take care that they don't want to take care of. OK, yeah. crime will go up. Uh, people will be killing themselves while trying to still have an abortion. Right? Truth. Like we, we, we know these things. We know these things about abortion. And yeah, we shouldn't be having late term abortions, barring some major catastrophe, you know, Agreed. And with, you know, for example, with, you know, uh, with the left, they, you know, they want, you know, the crazy lefts, right? Obviously yep. like the crazy lefts, they're like, oh, 39 in weeks. It's like, yeah, dude, no, 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 you know, and the crazy, right. Oh man, if you're raped, oh, well, you know, if, if you're raped, you know, and, and you get pregnant and you're 12 years old, have, fuck you. Yes, you know, greed. You See, know? that's so rational. Why, why is this so hard? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't understand why this is so fucking hard. I agree. You know, and I agree, but it, it's because we're we have these crazy people on each side. Yeah. You know, and and then uh, it, it moves, and then they're like, oh, and then it's like, oh no, that's and you you're forced to pick a stand, and I just don't. It's just we need like seven parties, you know. <laughs> I as agree. far as our political system. I you know? agree. You know, like it, dude, you can be a Republican and be what? Uh, be pro-choice. Pro-choice. Pro -choice. Democrat and be pro-life. I mean, pro-life. I mean, you could be a Democrat. And you can and be, be a, a Democrat party. and be like guns, pro-second pro amendment. Exactly. You know? Yeah. You know? You know, and there's just so much hypocrisy that goes on on both sides. Like right now, the, the right is all about freedom of speech. I'm all about it. But whether you agree with Colin Kaepernick kneeling for his freedom of speech. Like I would never, listen, I would never kneel for the flag ever, but nope. he did exercise his freedom of speech and he paid the consequences for it, but you should have let him do it. Like just let him do well, it. If you don't want Colin Kaepernick to kneel, then what you're going to get is riots. And you didn't like that either. So no. which one do you want? Yeah. Right. Which one do you want? He like, do you want him to kneel? Because that's as peaceful as it gets, right? I agree. That's as peaceful as it gets. It doesn't get any peaceful. And he didn't even do it out in the public the first couple of times. He went over to the bench and did it, yep. right? Truth. Away from the team, everything. And then somebody saw it and it, boom, took on a life of its own. It couldn't get more peaceful. Truth. But you don't like, uh, for example, the George Floyd riots, but you don't like that either. Right. So how am I supposed to protest? 
right? Agreed. Look, I you're agree. a black man. I'm a black man, right? And we can say we're mixed, but uh, at the end of the day, we're black, right? Yep. Like, because Color. that that's how we're going to see. That's how people are going to see us. Um, that's how we got rights was protesting, right? Yep. That's what Martin Luther King did. That's what Malcolm X did, you know, differently, but walk in the streets. So uh, it's never changed any other way without protest. Agreed. So how, how do you, how, you have to let me protest. Yep. You're, you're not supposed to like it. That's the thing. That, that's the whole point of protest. That's like the definition of the word almost. It is. I agree with you. <laughs> I can't see. Uh, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. I got a little nervous uh, for a second when we brought up the abortion topic, because I'm like, oh, man, we're going to piss like, you know, like, wh where's this going to go? But you're very reasonable and lean a little more one way. And maybe and I'm very reasonable. I think I guess I don't get to see I say if I'm very reasonable or not. That's for other people. Uh, yeah. I, and I lean a little more the other way, maybe. But I don't think we're that far off. And somehow oh. our sides have been made to be that far off yeah you know? both sides have been hijacked by extremists by extremists you know and i'll go all the way to the top with both trump and biden fucking Agreed. extremists for me extremists you know that are just listening to people scream uh, yeah and that's why i didn't vote for either one. Oh shit <laughs> you know and that's why you know i was like you know what man uh this ain't happening i'm not doing this i'm gonna vote for somebody else i don't even fucking care you know, and I actually talked a friend of mine into it who I've, I've always voted Democrat at the time up to that point, And he's always voting Republican. I was like, you don't like your guy and I don't like my guy, you know? So how about you and I just choose someone and we did a little research and we chose someone and we both voted for that person. Oh, that's pretty cool. You know, and we both voted for that person. I was like, come on, man. You know, like you, you, you actually hate your guy. You hate my guy a little more. I understand. Yeah. I feel the exact same way. Just flip the people. You know, so let's find somebody that we don't really hate that much. So, and that's the problem, right? Imagine that we're we're picking our leaders based on who we hate less. It's not even who that's, we like a little more. It's who we hate less. Yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it's craziness, right? Hmm, I'm going to get married. Which one of these girls do I hate less? Yeah, it's it's so ass so, backwards now. For sure. All right, man. A couple of questions as we close it. Sure. Um, I believe everyone has a unique power in the world. You know, yeah. they, they have a, the something that they go give to the world and then what they, they get something back. What, do, what would you say your power is? Um, I feel like I'm a very inspirational person. I really, truly like to motivate and inspire people. And I don't want anything back. Just seeing someone excel after I've give them that effort is all that I need. And it's an amazing feeling to, to, to see that, what's the word, uh, excitement in that power in them after you've ins inspired them. For sure. I, I agree with you. That's, that, that's where I feel mine is too. Like I, I, I love to uh, empower someone else and watch that grow. Like you yeah. plant that seed that they can do it. And once you plant the seed that they can do it to them, watch them go do it is amazing. Yeah, listen, everyone is always looking to be led, not because they're weak. They just want inspiration. There's sometimes I'm on social media and I get inspired by something. It's a great feeling, oh, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. Dude, I save reels all the time and repost them. That's yeah, what I, me like, too. It's the best, man. <laughs> it's the best. You know, you're like, damn, that one fucking hit. Hell yeah, let's go. Hard. You know? True. So, all right. My last question is, and, and look, I, I know like we have had a relationship like online and we've talked a little bit previously. So it was easy for you to say yes to the podcast. Uh, but in general, I think everyone always wants like this ROI, like, okay, I need an ROI on my time, you know? And it's like us, you know, like, and we're all, and I think it's a problem with the world a little bit is we're always looking for an ROI. There's really not going to be an ROI. I don't know if you're going to sell a ticket to your next show or, you know, uh, I'm not Rogan or Tim Ferriss or Jocko. So like your, your media won't blow up for coming on this, this podcast. Why take an hour out of your day and remove our French, remove our relationship a little bit to do some dude's podcast who might not, it might not move the needle at all. Human connection is the most important facet of life and having like new conversations with people, even when they're forced like this and not mm -hmm. knowing somebody is an incredible thing. 
you know, like me and you not talking before and then speaking right now, you realize how much you have in common with people. I'll give you a great example because I'm running for Senate. So like right. I go knocking on doors and I'm meeting random people and sometimes they're Democrat, sometimes they're Republican. But every single time, if they give me the opportunity to speak to them, everybody has the same problems. Everybody is literally the same. You know, so you don't realize that unless you actually go and speak to people. So speaking to somebody new is an amazing thing. And I love it. It's, it's my favorite thing. It's one of my favorite things to do. My wife, uh, I always say she won't go to the grocery store with me because uh, I, I've made friends with everybody in the grocery store. So <laughs> I, and look, we don't go to dinner or anything like that. I just know I'm going to go see him a couple of times a week. And yep. when I go to the store and I talk to them, you know, and it's great. Like the, 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 being able to have a conversation with anybody and really hear them is such an amazing thing. It's such an amazing skill that I've had to develop through podcasting. I really enjoy it. I, I agree. It is actually a, a great skill to have. And again, you're asked, you're, you're being asked questions on the fly and on the cuff compared to like, I, like I said, I hate the scripted stuff. Hate it. Cause you read, don't feel as connected. Read the paper, answer the question. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah, like when the person, like when you see them, they read the question and then they ask you and they read like, I'm like, oh, God, it's going to be a bad podcast. Yeah, right? You exactly. know, like, so, um, all right, man, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, if anybody resonated with you or connected in a way, tell them where they can reach out to you, follow you, all, all that stuff, like share it away. Yeah, my personal IG, so Steve Orozco, or you can just type in Mr. Smash, it should pop right up. Uh, my business, my IG is Smash Global for my MMA. I'm having my next show in Los Angeles on May 19th, smashglobal.com. All right. Guys, uh, first of all, Steve, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, you broached some, some difficult subjects, you know, and, and uh, I, I, pre I appreciate that when people, when people are willing to do that, you know, so thank you for that. And uh, as always, guys, look. Steve has his unique power that he goes out and he gives to the world. Uh, and that's great for him. And I have my unique power in the way that I give and get from the world. Don't go out in the world and try to be Steve. And then don't go out in the world to try to be me. Everybody go out there and find your own power.